Hey, Dr. Christensen here with you. Are you reacting to gluten or histamine? Quick summary is that many people feel better when they're off of gluten, but in truth, their symptoms could be caused by other things in the diet. So let's dive deep into that. So gluten-free diets are popular, and many have gone on them and seen benefits to their health, you know, better digestive symptoms, seemingly less bloating. Some need them because they have celiac disease, but many have gone on them for other concerns about gluten. And what are the drawbacks? Well, a couple are that they do end up being lower in fiber, higher in processed fats, lower in protein, and can, they can be more expensive. Now, of course, people can do them more thoughtfully and avoid those pitfalls, but as they're commonly done, those are things that typically do happen. So far, studies in populations that go, go, go gluten-free have shown they do not end up healthier from that. We see they have higher rates of diabetes, more weight gain, and also greater risk of cardiovascular risk factors, higher levels of cardiovascular risk factors. So where does gluten come from in most people's diets? Well, typically bread, baked goods, processed foods, pizza, beer. These foods are also really things that are high in histamine, and they're often seasoned with other ingredients that are also high in histamine. So the symptoms can really overlap. If we look at those of non-celiac gluten sensitivity and those of histamine intolerance, they're very similar. We've got things like bloating, gas, abdominal pain, reflux symptoms, nausea, vomiting, irregular bowels, constipation, fatigue, migraines, eczema, rash, dermatitis, hives, sinus symptoms, angioedema, and those all overlap. So let's talk about some terms here. Histamine is not something that is bad. It's a neurotransmitter. We use it for brain function. It's critical to regulate our immune response. It's in a category of compounds called biogenic amines, and it's made by some combination of amino acid conversion or bacterial formation. Other biogenic amines include serotonin, tyramine, phenylethylamine, tryptamine, cadaverine, and agmatine. So to say that, we have a hist that one can be intolerant or sensitive to histamine, that's a bit of a misnomer we cannot be intolerant to histamine any more than we can be intolerant to oxygen. However, like oxygen, too much can be a problem. And universally, if histamine levels are too high, people get symptoms. No one does not. So a histamine intolerance is really a misnomer. It's not a unique situation how they react to histamine, but it's generally more commonly a problem of how well someone can clear histamine, how well they can get rid of it. When there's elevations of it, even like just one or two nanograms per mil, everyone gets symptoms like their heart rate picks up, they feel flushing, they get a headache, rashes and hives can show up. When levels get higher, like three to five nanograms per mil, then we can see the blood pressure start to get unstable and the bronchioles start to spasm when that goes up a bit further. And finally, cardiac arrest at the highest levels. So the difference is some cannot clear it as well as others. I think that rather than histamine intolerance, we could call it histamine overload or histamine accumulation. Those would be more accurate. And these symptoms come about to anyone if they ingest really high amounts of that. So there are some things like, for, like um, spoiled seafood that'll have very high amounts of histamine in which nearly everyone gets symptomatic. But we get rid of histamine by a series of various enzymes that clear it. And that includes ones like monoamine oxidase, diamine oxidase, histamine N-methyltransferase, the one that seems the most distinct is diamine oxidase in terms of many people having slower activity for that enzyme. The other variable is that there are mast cells that release histamine. So we're releasing it, we're making it, and we're ingesting some of it. It comes from both making it and getting it from the foods. So those are all ways that there can be overload from that. But the core issue is not clearing it fast enough or really unusual sources of excesses. So what are some high histamine foods? That's not a straightforward question. There's no clear consensus on how to measure histamine in foods and how much foods have. So there's a lot of tables you'll see, but there's no consensus among experts on which tables are more correct. There's also huge variability in foods from batch to batch. Like if we were to say that you know, spinach, for example, is sometimes categorized as a high histamine food, but the leaves versus the stems and the spring plants versus the summer plants, they can vary tremendously from batch to batch, how it's cooked or processed. So it's hard to put a hard, a, a, an exacting level on that. Some ones that are classically higher are gonna include alcohol, aged cheese, 
cured meats, yeast products, tomato products, oftentimes histamine. But then we think also about more so contaminated or spoiled foods as being relevant. So how does someone know if this is relevant to them? Well, a couple ways to diagnose this. If someone does get some of these symptoms like that, then you want to be aware if this was a factor or not. Not only just because avoiding the foods, but because there's reasons why your body is not clearing histamine. And that's the thing, we always want to know why it's happening, because it's going on for some reason. So even if you do have simply a histamine overload, and if cutting the foods down helps you, that's good that you found a, a, a temporary solution or a factor that helps. But the best outcome is to still know why that is happening and what are the underlying stressors giving rise to that. So in terms of diagnosing it, there's blood tests that show the activity of diamine oxidase. And if that enzyme level is low, then that's somewhat diagnostic of it. Now, this is not a perfect test. It's pretty good in the sense of when you have an abnormality in diamine oxidase that you do have a problem with histamine. But the drawback is, one study that looked at people that had suspected histamine intolerance saw that only 24% had a blood abnormality. So there's future tests that are going to be looking at urinary levels of histamine, how much is being released. That may be helpful. Those are not yet commonly available. They'll measure histamine directly, but also methylated versions of histamine. To date, probably the best thing would be the skin prick test. So if you give histamine in a tiny injection below the skin, like a tuberculosis test, we call that a wheel. So not like wheel on a car, but W-H-E-A-L. If you make a tiny little bleb under the skin with histamine, some people really react to that. They get more of a rash, and it goes away in a bit. But that level of reaction is our most accurate predictor of histamine intolerance. And then that does confirm, when that shows up, that there likely will be some benefit for a low histamine diet. And a question is, why not just do the diet and see if you get better? It's a valid approach, but the pitfall is that, again, there's so many relevant properties to foods, and you don't necessarily know if you did better because you lowered histamine or because you cut out alcohol or you cut out cured meats for other reasons. So it's so nice to have better targeted applications. One study did look at a diet and looked at symptoms afterwards, and they saw that they could reduce urticaria, which is chronic recurrent hives. And they did a specific diet for people and tracked them afterwards. And the base idea was to look at histamine levels. And what they saw was that um, anchovies, sausage, ham, chicken, tuna, anchovies, shrimp, miso, spinach, kimchi, cheeses, seaweeds, they cut these foods out for four weeks. So over the course of four weeks, they were on this diet, which was on lower amounts of those histamine-type foods. And they did see symptomatic improvements. You know, a good percentage of them did. And they did show that levels of blood histamine lowered. But the diamine oxidase activity did not change. Another approach has been, if the issue is often low diamine oxidase, why not just supplement with that? Reasonable idea. You know, also, not a core causative factor, but if there's some benefit, if it's harmless enough, why not pursue it? So one of the best blinded studies on that was done for migraines. And that can also be a symptom related to histamine, is just headaches and migraines. So they gave a group of people diamine oxidase supplements or placebos, and they watched to see how long migraines lasted for them. Well, the supplements did help. And if you look at just the title or the abstract, it sounded like a pretty rosy outcome. And there were no side effects. But when you dug really deep into it, it turned out that compared to the placebo group, that the diamine oxidase supplements reduced migraine duration by about 6%. So what that means is average headaches change from roughly 7 hours and 30 minutes down to about 6 hours and 40 minutes. So it wasn't so much they just stopped them in their tracks, but they may have gone down by a bit. And that was such a small amount that it may not show up in future studies. So if you've had concerns that sound like inflammation, swelling, hives, itching, rashes, headaches, swelling, uh, digestive swelling, bloating. These things can be driven by excess histamine. And now that is more measurable. So there are good skin tests that can show that. And if it's there, then the question is, why is this going on? And a good physician will work up and make sense out of what are the immune stressors? If there are chronic allergens, if there are digestive problems, what else is going on? But why is it the body is not clearing it properly? That's the real question. Dr. Christensen here with you, and we'll talk in really soon. Bye-bye.